Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today and welcome to today's upload. Before we get into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. Finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost a cent. Click that like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon, and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to today's upload, shall we? Hello, Jeffrey, my friend. With careful consideration, even if I do this anonymously, there is still possibilities of being identified, which would be no fault of your own. Government and agencies within the governments can do things that can destroy your life in an instant. I must decline your offer of telling my story on the air. But what I have done for you, I have written it out to the best of my recollection and memory to go a bit more into depth without compromising the State Security Act. I hope you find a more complete encounter of interest. I wrote it out as much information as I possibly could give. I hope to hear the full account on your channel if you are willing to retell it. Hello again, Jeffrey, the encounter of a Brigadier General. This encounter took place just over 30 years ago now in 1989-90. I am now a retired Brigadier General from the IDF military forces, but still work for my government. A great deal of all of this is still classified by my government personnel slash country of origin and places cannot be named, I'm sorry. I can tell you more than what I did in the first go around, as I did not want to drag it out. I was a full-ranked colonel at the time and head of some important black op operations I was summoned by my commanding officer and informed I was going to be the head of a very unusual mission overseas somewhere in Europe, and all the men were specifically picked. I was told this mission was to locate, retrieve, or take out target or targets. I was handed a file that had stamped in red, top secret, classified. My CO said only, you and the government agent that you will meet at the other end may see this. The government agent was female. We will name her Laura. She was placed for a number of reasons. One, to give the impression of a family unit. The other reasons are classified for most part of the journey to the safe house was pretty uneventful. And in the middle of nowhere, nothing out of the ordinary. And as we drove into the area, you felt the atmosphere completely change. For one moment, you heard the birds and nature all around you. Once we drove into the area that suddenly came to an abrupt halt, and you felt suddenly very uncomfortable. I thought this was odd, but didn't take that much notice of it. The house was three stories in height as we came to a stop and got out of the vehicles. Agent Laura, knowing our ETA was waiting on the doorstep for our arrival, did not go unnoticed by one of the only two families that remained in the area. The neighbor came over to us, who we will call Jonathan. He said it was nice to have new people moving into the area, as well as other families had all of a sudden packed up and never came back. I will fast forward it a bit, as this was just over two months for this operation. Over the period of time that we were at the safe house, we had... A number of strange encounters. 
I was informed that a dark figure had been seen running through the woods tapping on the glass late at night. Strange noises, scratch marks, huge piles of crap. Jonathan was also the neighbor that had a golden retriever one evening. He came over and he was telling us about the other families that lived there. Who had young children and animals, cats, small to medium to even large dogs that had disappeared over a matter of months. Let's get to that night in question. It was one of those extremely hot Indian summers that we were experiencing. I shared my quarters with my captain, who we will call Jay. He was the second highest ranked officer next to myself. It was so incredibly hot that night you couldn't sleep. And if you did, you did not sleep very well. I woke up around three-ish, and all of a sudden I heard this dog suddenly cry out in pain. Then it was quiet. About five or six minutes later, I heard this thud in the backyard. I continued to lie on my bunk, and then all of a sudden I heard something going crunch, crunch, crunch. And then you heard a ripping sound, and again you heard that crunch, crunch, crunch. I quietly got out of my bunk and walked over to the window. At the bottom of the yard was this massive black shape that had somewhat of a silvery shine thanks to the moonlight that night. Whatever this was, it was sitting on its back legs, its back straight like a person crouched down. Its head was massive with two very pointed ears on the top of its head, twitching about frantically, listening for any sound it could hear. Captain J was still sleeping, much to my surprise, and all of a sudden I heard this voice. A voice that was very guttural, very deep, and powerful. I heard it say, first of all, I know you are watching me. It started to stand and looked right at me. At the same time, I saw these deep, yellow, orange, burning eyes suddenly appear. As it stood up, the head turned over the shoulder. You could see the twist in the midsection as its shoulder came into view. Its fur was black, extremely shiny, and long in certain places. What details you could see with the moonlight was very impressive. This creature's torso was extremely ripped with muscle, extremely powerful, the same with what you could see of its legs. Its arms were extremely long and hairy. The digits you could see its nails were extremely long and also pointed which could do considerable damage, and then spoke again. I can hear you. I can smell you as this creature stood up. It was just about seven feet tall, maybe taller. I saw what it was eating. It had killed Jonathan's golden retriever. All I could see what was left was the two back legs and its tail. All of a sudden I heard Jay say, What in the hell was that, sir? I stopped and looked back at Jay for no more than a blink of an eye. I looked back out of the window and whatever this was, it had jumped the fence and went. I said to the captain, under no circumstances is this to go into your report come daybreak. I woke the captain up and I said, I'm going into the yard. I walked down to the bottom, what was about 100 to 110 yards or so. All I saw was blood and fur and pieces of flesh. I found the dog's head in the corner. It had been clearly ripped off and thrown. I went looking around and found a spade to bury what remained of the dog, hosed down the area to clean up the blood and mess. But how will I never forget that voice and those eyes that looked right through me? A day later, Jonathan comes over and asks if we have seen his dog. We had to say no, but we knew the truth of what happened that evening. Nine days after this, we completed our mission, got back into our vehicles, back to the airport, and then home. This is the full encounter. Thank you, Jeff, for sharing it. I trust you will not disclose any of my information. Today's second worldwide subscriber submission Hello Jeff, I live in Western Canada and I've been an avid hunter and target shooter since my teen years. I'm semi-retired from a military career filled with travel and adventure. 
Deer hunting was my great passion, and although this never followed through naturally to bear hunting, I never gave up an opportunity to also hunt feral wild boar. With an occasional coyote hunt, if a farmer asked for my assistance putting down some chicken thieves, not long ago, while upland bird hunting in the northern boreal forest, I bumped into what I can best describe as a hyena, and we both parted ways after a brief encounter at a close distance. It jarred me somewhat, and the few trusted persons I related this to were extremely skeptical, so I kept my mouth shut from then onwards. However, I did have plans to encourage other hunters to accompany me to where I first encountered this hyena-like creature. I even had the pretense cover story to bring heavier than usual firearms under the tale that this area is plagued with black bear and wolf packs. Believe me, this is not a huge stretch of truth in this swampy northern boreal forest. I purposely left out the hyena-like beast encounter for fear they would not believe me, or worse still, label me as an unreliable kook who could not be trusted. I even have a small stockpile of unusual ammunition to choose from. 100 German Brennique classic 12-gauge slugs with the felt wad. The Alaskan State Trooper issue this same slug for local grizzly, polar, and black bear. Also, 75 rounds of heavy shot hog wild .625 caliber buckshot that's now discontinued remarkably. You would not believe the felt recoil of these rounds through a normal 12 gauge pump action shotgun, but with an improved modified choke, I get about a 3 inch spread at 25 meters. Jeffrey, that's mighty comforting to have loaded in your shotgun and loose in your hunting coat pockets in the North Country. Same for the German Breniques. Anyways, I had three good companions in mind that were two ex-army buddies and the son of one of these fine gentlemen. I trusted them all to be stalwart companions in this tight situation and would never abandon me either. I had them convinced that in our group of four, two each could pair up, and one in each pair armed with a 12 gauge, and I could provide the bear bullets just in case, so we could cover each other in case of a close encounter with the bear. You know this is still a bit deceitful of me, and I regret this thin veil of secrecy. Anyways, a week or so before my plan to return to this hunting with this hunting party, I was at a local outdoor pistol range on a very nice day. I wanted to try out my 45 caliber revolver at the 25 meter range. I was there and had just fired six shots and was reviewing my target and about to reload. The whispering wind brought to my nose a horrid scent of dead animal and wet dog combined into one gut-wrenching stench. I was kind of surprised and I realized suddenly there was no one else at this range as the nearby rifle shooters had quietly packed up and left soon after I had arrived. My first inclination was this must be a black bear, but I was not taking any chances and quickly, almost frantically, reloaded my forty-five. Then I came to another conclusion. There is no way that only one could be circling me as there is at least two breaks in the edge of the tree line. To my right and left approximately 10 meters each side. Horrified, now I realized I was literally in the middle of them encircling me, not the bear. I'd never seen them, but I had that very uneasy feeling of being watched and an ominous, threatening feeling deep in my gut. That distinct odor from at least three different locations, but I had mediocre control with a firearm literally within my hand, so my fear was tempered somewhat. Like a flash, it came to me that I had to extricate myself immediately with only my forty-five as my means of protection. 
Without reason or thinking, I announced loudly I was armed and prepared to defend myself in retrospect. I'm pretty damn stupid. Except results from. But this was a visceral reaction. Loaded gun held muzzle upwards, I walked quickly back to my Chevy, keeping my trigger finger alongside the trigger guard, all the time trying to watch my six as well. Yes, I was now inside of my truck cab with a loaded handgun. I was thankfully a very, very rare event for me. One I hope to never repeat in my lifetime. I drove out of there quickly, and I was two miles away when I pulled over and first stopped then calmly unloaded my revolver and composed myself. While I was doing this, I did have a fixation. Something out there knew I had a plan to return to its forest home with armed companions. I truly believe it wanted me to know fully well this was a very bad idea, and it wanted me to know that they know my life habits and where I am most vulnerable to them at a time and place of their choosing. You can imagine I changed my plans, Jeff. I did not follow through with my initial plan, and only once did one of my army buddies question my reluctance after initially being so enthusiastic to guide them to this one remote hunting spot. And I have never had this happen to me ever since at the outdoor range. It was not hard to provide a fabricated excuse to my buddies, and I definitely feel this is the better outcome. I don't believe we truly do understand the nature, true capabilities of this very unusual forest creature, Jeff. I don't have the tools or means to evaluate this threat. Therefore, it's unworthy and stupid to place others at unknown risks as well just because you don't want to be alone in front of it. If this was a black bear, wolf slash wolves, cougar, or wild boar, it would now have its head hanging off of my living room wall. But I believe deeply it was none of those creatures. Take care, my friend. Today's third worldwide subscriber dogman submission. Hello Jeff, I'll start by giving a brief background on my mom and how she came to encounter the dog man on two separate occasions. My mother grew up during the 50s and 60s in a small town of rural New South Wales in the southeast of Australia. Although she never saw or even heard of dog man until her encounter in 2018, she has, however, heard of Yahweh's, or Sasquatch slash Bigfoot sightings, in the areas surrounding her hometown. She spent her life moving around the country and being a mom, until one day she had a yearning in her heart to see her hometown once again. So she left the outback of Queensland for her hometown of Parks, New South Wales. She couldn't land a house or accommodation in the town itself, but found a rental out at an old Air Force base called Bogan Gate that currently runs as an explosives manufacturing plant surrounded by a seven-foot barbed wire fence. Inside are cordoned off areas where civilians are not allowed, yet the old barracks of the Air Force personnel were available to the public for rental vacancy. It seemed no one stayed there long, as most houses were empty or used by fly-in, fly-out mine site workers and a couple of senior citizens living the quiet life. So my mother moves into one of these old Air Force houses. She was there for roughly four to six months. I was in Perth, Western Australia at the time of her encounters. Although seedings though we have a close relationship she chose to call me when she was terrified for her life late one night. At the time, I was unaware of Dogman, so I could not understand what she was seeing or going through. She told me a kangaroo got through her window. She screamed and it took off. I thought nothing of it, calmed her down with a conversation, and finished the call and went to sleep. 
Later, however, I would put two and two together and discover her encounter was indeed a dog man and could not have been anything else. It had to have been a dog man. This is what she told me. She was watching television late one night in her living room at around midnight. The living room is surrounded by windows that are pulled up and out like a 90 degree awning style opening. To open that window, you would have had to have grabbed the window and pulled up and out. So she was watching TV and she hears this crashing sound of the curtains and looks over. At about five meters away is this black arm reaching in. She claims she saw not only the arm, but a chest as well, and a big one at that. Someone apparently getting in the house. She thought it was one of the islanders of the fly-in, fly-out workers across the road breaking in drunk or something. She screamed and it took off. This is where it gets weird. Her second encounter confirms in my eyes that the black arm and huge chest was a dog man. She heard a banging against the glass window again in the living room. She looked over and saw what she said was a black kangaroo. And living in Australia, I can tell you kangaroos are never black. It was banging its face against the window on the outside of the house, seven feet off the ground. Not jumping like a roo, but headbunting the glass and making a bleeding sound she could not describe. She was sounding terrified at the time, crying when she was talking about it. Would a roo do that to a person? No way. She has always felt like she was being watched, and when she called me that night, she told me a kangaroo jumped through her window. Later, she told me its face, chest, arms were black, shaped like a man. She could hardly describe it, like she was remembering scenes from a dream. Also, around the back of the house is another area between the back fence and the perimeter fence where late one night my sister and her partner heard great heavy galloping past the house. What else could this have been? I can only conclude Dogman. I would not be so sure, but I have heard of other sightings in the same general area from multiple sources. Absolutely terrifying. But I feel an attraction to these things in Yahweh's and cryptids in general. If money were no issue, I would spend much time and resources looking for these things. Also, my mother said that the scariest part was the eyes. She said in that split second, when that black kangaroo was headbunting her living room window, she said the eyes were penetrating and extremely creepy. But these encounters lasted only a small collection of moments. My name is N.H., and I live in Perth, Western Australia. For that, present this how you would like, Jeff. Thanks for giving your time and consideration to mine and my mother's encounter. Today's fourth worldwide subscriber submission. Hello, Jeff. How are you? Okay, well, here goes. I am still trying to clean crap out of my underwear. So I work in the mining game and often travel from Perth to Western Australia to the far reaches of our great state. This encounter happened in one of those trips just a little under a month ago. The drive is about two days to get to where I was going, so I left early in the morning from my midway point at around 2.30 in the morning. But for some reason I couldn't keep my eyes open, so I decided to pull over in one of the many rest stops on the side of the road. These are nothing like your rest stops in the States. Generally, just a dirt track off the highway, no facilities. I pulled in and rolled back the seat to grab 20 to 30 minutes of shut-eye. I left the truck running because it was cold outside and I had the heater on. I must have dozed off because the next thing I knew I was woken by scratching on the glass on the passenger side of the truck. Didn't think much of it because there was no one out there. Then, not a second later, I heard this guttural low growl that sounded like a large dog menacing in a way that is a warning before they bite you. I literally was paralyzed with fear to the point of noticing I was now sitting in a puddle of my urine. I was that scared and I could not move or breathe. I just stared at this thing, unable to comprehend what I was seeing. 
The window was cracked about a centimeter to stop the cabin from misting up. And this thing raised its nose to the opening like it was trying to get a proper sniff of me. Like I said, I was paralyzed with fear and unable to move a muscle, still not believing what I was seeing. But this time it was around 4.30 or 5, so still dark at this time of the year. It stared at me for what felt like an eternity, but I think it was only about a minute or so. Then it started making its way around the front of the truck. Also, I must add that it was at the height of the window, which is around seven feet in your measurements, all with watching me and baring its teeth as it never took its eyes off of me. As it was coming around the windscreen, it broke eye contact as it moved past the door to the front. At that point is when I broke out of my trance and slammed the truck into gear and took off as fast as I could. Get that m truck moving. I was hoping to hit it, but it moved out of the way too fast. I could see it in the trailer lights, just standing there on two feet. And as the back end of the truck went past it, it lumbered off into the brush at such a pace. It was as if you blinked and you missed it. I don't know how much you know about Australia, but up north, there is hundreds and hundreds of square kilometers of nothing. These things could hide out here forever and never be seen. I'm sorry if it's not more exciting, but it was plenty for me. Needless to say, I don't stop on the side of the road anymore, no matter how tired I am. Thank you for taking the time to share my boring encounter. I listen to your channel, but never thought these things existed in Australia before. Maybe this is what the old tales refer to as the bunny yip in our folklore. Thank you, Jeffrey. GW. Today's fifth. Worldwide subscriber, Dogman Submission. Hello, Mr. Nadolny. Six months ago, I had no idea that Dogman ever existed. Because of what I saw in a clear day, I started to search the internet. I fell upon skinwalkers. I didn't know about them. I fell upon Dogman, and my heart started to race. I'm 60 years old, and I've experienced many things in my life like everyone does. First thing that occurred to me, a bus stop, bus station scream. I lived in Sherbrooke, Quebec, Canada since 2009. Previously, I lived in a much larger city. I like this city here, surrounded by wooded areas. The city of Sherbrooke sits at a junction of two rivers, the St. Francis and the Magog River. You will notice that dogmen love creeks and rivers, since we can see far away the U.S. mountains from the road near my boyfriend's apartment facility. I understand now these creatures love creeks and small rivers to travel around in order to hide, drink, and hunt quietly and undercover. I said undercover because they do in subterranean areas like ours too. One night between 9 and 10, I was the last remaining person waiting for my transfer bus at the Seagap bus transfer station. I don't remember the year exactly, sorry about that. It was a cold night of fall. As I said, I was alone by myself waiting for my transfer in my winter coat. Suddenly, up in the distance, I hear a powerful, awful, unknown animal scream like a T-Rex in Jurassic Park movie. I froze right there. It was far away in the east area of the city, probably coming from the woods around. I got scared and decided to wait inside the waiting room area. What in the hell was that? I have no idea up till now. Since that day, I was afraid to wait for the bus alone at the station. The second occurrence, 2018, don't remember the date at all. I have to explain that I live on a boulevard called Levegre? into an apartment building. My boyfriend lives in the same boulevard, but further down, about three stops from me. At night, both of us can take the same bus to go back home. 
He drops off the bus first before me. Three stops later, I drop off the bus too, go home. My apartment building is circled by homes, a soccer field, a fireman station, and other apartment buildings as well. Not too scary. My boyfriend lives in a complex facility made of two twin buildings for handicapped persons from the wheelchair to people to other kind of impaired people. When I encountered my boyfriend three years ago, there was only one building there. All apartments are based on the first level. They built and opened the second building, a twin type of the first one, but down the hill, just 100 yards away from the first one. I never go down there because I just can't stand the woods in the back of these buildings, especially the second one, even in the daytime, which is more down the hill. And it's all dark and low from the street. I don't like the feeling at all. Gives me the creeps. Always gave me a feeling of being watched just facing the handicapped complex facility. On the other side of the boulevard, there is an East Industry Center. And there is only companies there. Only those who work night shift are there at nights. All of this is cut into the wooded areas, little creeks of water, wild tuckets, etc. Those are full of white-tailed deer, fox, raccoon, squirrel, country mice, birds, and ravens. Kind of cute. Sometimes, when we watch television late at night, we see a group of deer eating grass and crossing the boulevard to the industrial center for other nearby wooded areas. I used to wait for the bus late at night. The bus stop facing the apartment of my boyfriend, but on the other side of the boulevard. Never alone. My boyfriend waited with me equipped with a flashlight in order to flash the bus driver to pick me up. It was dark when the bus ride up to the dark curve, and he just couldn't see someone waiting at the stop. I'm scared most of the time. I never wait alone at night. There is a big telephone pole line at the bus stop. This is important for the rest of the encounter. Because on top of that, it happened on the daytime, not nighttime. One night I decided to sleep over at my boyfriend, who had to wake up early in the morning. Told him I would take the bus back home later in the day. Wasn't scared of daytime on the other side of the street. So my boyfriend left that morning and I kind of slept a little longer. Later, I got prepared and checked the bus pamphlet, locked the door with my own key and headed for the bus stop on the other side of the boulevard. When you wait at the bus stop, you look down at your left to see the, if the bus is coming. There is woods, a company, woods again, yada yada. When you look at your right, same thing, but going up on the hill. That day, right besides the telephone pole, I looked to my right, then I saw something. I put myself further out of the telephone pole and looked again. What is that? No cars, no trucks, nobody but that enormous black mass. Just a jet black mass that was there on the side of the road like an ink blast on the pitcher. Wasn't moving, lasted 20 seconds, and was on the same side of the street as me now about 50 yards away. My mind was racing. What is that? I thought it was a lost cow. Nope, not a cow. Not a bear. Not a bike. Not a car. Not a motorcycle. Not someone. Why all of that would be jet black, first of all. Not a biker. Not a bicycle. Not one or a group of deer. Deer are not jet black. What the hell is it? Looks like something half seated by the road like animal. Definitely not a bear. No bear looks like that. There is no bear here. Not a dog. Much too massive. My head was trying to apply the right label to this thing. It looks like it was frozen right there. I turned my head left to see if the bus is coming from down the hill. Yes, it was coming. I turned my head right again. The thing was not there anymore. Two seconds, it was gone. Took my bus and looked out the window. Nothing. The aftermath. Was not scared. Didn't know anything at the time. Searched for a black thing on the road. Fall on dogman. Jet black dogman. Froze. 
and all the hair on my body stood up since that day. One scared the heck out of me to go outside after dusk even though the sighting was on a beautiful day. Two, ordered and read Linda Godfrey's book, Real Werewolf True Encounters of Modern America. Realized that the thing was very smart because he got into in view only to cross over the boulevard when it did not see or hear cars coming. Four froze when it realized I was by the side of the telephone pole. He thought he or she was alone. Five took the moment. I look on my left to disappear that fast. No idea if it stayed on the same side of the road or not. Six couldn't believe its attitude, pretending to be frozen in order to mix me up. Very clever. Seven told my boyfriend to never walk home after dusk. He does now. Thank him for listening to me so dearly. Told him not to do any landscaping unless it's morning and garbage also, never out at night. 8. Did not know about Dogman before this. 9. I am very stressed out now. Have nightmares, lack of sleep. 10. Will never be the same. Became obsessed. Scared like hell to go outside by myself. Number 12. Still don't know what it was, but nothing I knew for sure. 13. Took me two months to go back to my boyfriend's place day or night. 14. Don't want a house or an apartment near a wooded area or in the countryside ever. Told my daughter not to buy a house in the country or near the woods. Don't want my grandchildren to go camping ever. All right, folks. Just an assortment of horrifying military kill team encounters. I hope you all enjoyed them as much as I enjoyed sharing them with you. Guys, with that being said, thank you once again for supporting the channel. After all, it is your support that keeps this channel growing and going and what makes it a place where people want to share their experiences, ideas, and theories with zero ridicule, zero judgment, and just simply treated with the respect that we all deserve. Please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They're out there and they're dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for answers, and God bless.